over righty. Okay. So Olivier, thank you so much for doing this. I know we had to reschedule and I really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure, really. Um, I want to go back to the beginning a little bit with you, um, you know, get uh, those first inklings in your mind's eye when you realized you wanted to work in fashion. I believe it was quite young. I, I've heard, I've read that it was like you were seven or eight when you first wanted to be a designer. Well, actually I was just, <sighs> I think it's so far back that I don't really remember my first fashion memories. It is that that far. I think I was obsessed immediately by women wearing dresses, by the fabric, by the look of men in beautiful attire. And as far as you go back to my first sketches as a child, it was immediately you know costumes and dresses and and actually i was i was drawing a lot of fashion silhouettes without really knowing it was a fashion drawing or a fashion sketch and it's one day that an adult told me oh you're going to be a couturier or you could do this as a job but i understood that and so by age seven i was saying all the time that i was going to be a couturier well, you called it. Um, I was really surprised in doing some research on you that when you, you went to one of the most prestigious um, fashion schools, uh, La Combe, yeah, am I pronouncing that right? Um, yeah, yeah. And, and then you didn't graduate, you left, you know, through your studies to start your own label. What gave you the, the, the balls, let's say, to, to decide I'm gonna leave and go and launch my own line now? What happened in your mind's eye that you're just like, let's do this? I don't know what actually happened. It's strange. I, I think I, I follow strongly my instincts. There was something is that, I mean, I was pretty young. I was 19 and there was something, everything was going very well at school, but uh, I, I was a little bit like bitter, slightly angry. I had like a lot of stress financially for these collections. And I was very stressed to ask help from my parents to do student collections and uh, I know that I came back at school early January and something went off with a professor because there was like potential sponsoring using like an alcohol brand for helping me and they were not for it there was something weird happening and I decided to never go back and I just left and so you immediately launched your, your own label, which already started generating buzz. And then what, uh, not even a year later, I think, you were 21 and oh, there all of a sudden there's Madonna at the height of her career, wearing your piece, not just wearing your piece, but also wearing it to the Academy Awards, the Oscars. I mean, this is before social media, this is before internet where you could you know, DM a, a top stylist and get your stuff on a, on a, on a, you know, a celebrity. How did your life yeah. change at that moment? I mean, that, that was radical. It's very organic. Uh, it's very organic. Actually, while I was at school, I was already helping with stylings, assisting on photo shoots, or and I I didn't. I was an assistant, a dresser assistant on a show that was on the coast of Belgium, and I think I was assistant to the D squared, Dean and Dan. Oh wow! And uh, I was assisting for dressing up the boys. And then uh, the year later, this was happening again, and it was the year I left school. And so I, I had been making clothes at home and everything. And I, the guy who was producing this event was uh, Etienne Rousseau, who's like Villa Eugenie. They, they're working a lot still in fashion for very important shows today. But at the time, he was mostly working in Belgium, and he was already doing the Driven Open shows in Paris. And I visited him and showed him my clothes with a model friend, and he was okay to put me in the show. Then I got at the time Cookie Salvert, who was a PR, famous PR in Paris, who spots my collection and said, like, I can present your collection for for free. Just bring the clothes to Paris and I put them in my showroom. It just started so organically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And but what was it like that moment when when you discovered Madonna was wearing your piece, did you know she was going to be wearing it to the Oscars? I didn't know, but actually she wore some of the things I did before that. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually it's on my birthday on January 4th that I received a fax from Ines von Lamsuerd and Vinut Matadin. And they were requesting clothes for a shoot styled by Ariane Phillips 
on Madonna and I received this fax. I still have the fax. Wow. It's on my birthday. And I send them the clothes. And so she she starts wearing some of them, using them in photo shoots and uh, photo shoots and wearing them for the launch of her then uh, new album. And uh, no, that was very, very helpful for me. But many of the of everything was helpful i think still today for a person who's starting everything is helpful but at the time i also had isabella blow mm -hmm. who picked some clothes and put them in on on the cover of uh, of uh, the sunday times the, the the sunday edition where you have like a fashion ad i got uh, karina Givargisov who did an article in the face magazine and was still like I wasn't yet a designer, sort of. And some of these people, they did amazing for me because everybody was reading the Face magazine or looking at the styling from this person and like paying attention to the new names. And Yeah, you had, I mean, you definitely, but I think that, you know, real creatives, when they see great talent, and I'm not just doing this because I know you and you know, trying to be nice, but when you see great talent, you want to support that great talent. And you were pretty much in the late, 90s and the early 2000s like the it designer coming up and coming designer and you were yet and you were so young at that time still how did you deal with the pressure of being the, the hot young designer at, a, at that time when you were so you know early in your career well i wasn't aware of that i wasn't aware i, I think i mean my friends probably would joke about it but i i, I can be a little bit naive and when i started I was more serious about the way my pants were cut and if I was right with my jacket. It was, I left school early, so it was al almost like learning mm -hmm. while doing the collections. And I was very focused on that. And I was living in Brussels, which was like far from any like Strassi or I was barely in Paris. And so I, I wasn't really aware of that. But I was also, I was kind of aware of the effect I was generating when we were doing the show and I was seeing and uh, and I've, I was very happy. And something that struck me was the day that uh, Elsa Clench. Ah, yes. Was, I, was, I was a fan of Elsa Clench when I was a young teenager because I was always looking at CNN style on CNN with Elsa Clench. And when Elsa Clench came to the, to the show, I think it was the second, this struck me. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there was Elsa Clench, Polly Mellon, and then I, re I really understood. Like, mm -hmm. I really got it. I was like out of school at the moment this kind of person started appearing and I was understanding. That's crazy. Mm. And then quite quickly, because you, like we said, we launched in uh, 97 and then by 2002, Rochas came knocking at your door. What made you decide to take that on? And then at that point, you kind of decided to put all your energy into that and close your namesake brand and to focus on that. And it was also so different. I, I'll never forget that first show you did. I mean, it was just the, the shape, the, the hump on the back, let's say. It was more, it's more elegant than that, but I don't know how to explain it otherwise. And, and you close your own and you open a Rochas and your own brand was very dark colors, very goth, that people had described it at the time. And this was just so different. It was so feminine in its own way, very, you know, very romantic and very different shapes and proportions. How did you make that switch? I actually closed my business back then after spring, summer 2002, which I produced and shipped to stores. Uh, but spring, thousand, uh, spring, summer 2002 was just after the Twin Towers. Yeah. And there was like such a situation and I wanted to work in Paris and I wanted to work in a situation where I was fantasizing about being a designer with a team, not being just on my own with like two person helping me. And like, I was more like imagining like, oh, that must be amazing to work in a house and couture and Paris. And so I decided to, to stop my business after like, we must be like the middle of 2002. And by chance I got, a proposition for some for a small moment i was kind of like really jobless mm -hmm. i was like wondering what am i going to do it was very stressful and i also wanted to keep working with some of the people i like to work with and then i mean i had a boyfriend in berlin and once i was spending some time there and i got a phone call from rochas and i actually didn't really know what it was as a brand it wasn't a brand 
that was out there. Fashion was, it had stopped since the 50s, it's fashion. And then I found out my mother had been uh, wearing a perfume from Rochas. And I had a friend in Paris who had a small book of, on the brand because obviously no internet, you could not make any research. And by watching this small book, there was a lot about lace. I just have a book, of Roche, like that's the lace of Rochas. Oh yeah. So, and I even have like the old book, like that was the book that he had shown me. So it's like an 80s book. It's a, everything is black and white, you yeah. see. So that's maybe from it, like there was 10 pictures that I like it in the whole book and that was enough. I was like, there are like little birds here, like black lace, Chantilly, my favorite. So that's probably what I should do. And so tell me a little bit about how, the, what it was like for you because you had, you know, the, your time at Rochas, you were creating new silhouettes. Everyone was talking about you. You did that in from, till 2006 and then you and then they just kind of at the same point that you're getting the awards for like the CFDA international you know designer award the Rochas decides to close its fashion department at that same time was that like this like a slap to the face what how did you react to that I mean was it were you already like seeing the writing on the wall what was that experience like well the story is longer um it's funny because it's a whole, like, that makes me think of someone, that make, make, makes me think of Sally Singer, because when I was closing the Tescan's house, the small Tescan's house, I did a draw a collection in case I would continue. Mm -hmm. And Sally was working on an article and she came to, to Brussels to visit me. And so she was aware of the collection I was doing for myself. And I was working a lot about the 50s in a bizarre way, for Tescans, mm -hmm. in a very rock and roll way, more like rockabilly sort of way, and like destroyed new look sort of way. And I shut the, the, my, my thing, I go to Paris, and I start being involved on Russia's, and then sort of like Sally came back on, on following up with what I was doing and uh, I was completely stuck in the 50s like imagining reshaping and uh, reapproaching all of that in a, in, a, in a more couturier gesture. It's very funny. So I had signed maybe six months and I had already done maybe my first show mm -hmm. and then I was having like a tea with Sally and she announced me, have you seen the Procter & Gamble just bought the group uh, uh, that owns Rochas because mm -hmm. Rochas was part of a group, a European group, a smaller group of perfumes. They had Gucci, uh, several nice perfumes, and they got bought by Procter and Gamble. And I was like, "Whoa, that's great! It's going to be better, bigger." Yeah, more funds. Yeah. Yeah, nice. And in the end, I mean, it was a long process because almost even more than a year before we were discussing about the problematics that Procter & Gamble was facing because they had no interest in fashion. They had, no one was really taking care of any fashion brand there because they had any. Mm -hmm. They were very, very big, their specialty of perfumes or chemicals, all these things. And they had no one to any, make even like a management decision mm -hmm. on what they were doing. So they couldn't continue it. Mm -hmm. So for a while, I was hoping we would find a solution, eventually sell the brand, or do something. I, I tried to do, I, I see, no, it's like so far back, like we're talking yeah. about something 15 years ago. I have no problem to talk about it anymore. But at the time I was, I was, it was a big sign. And I was really careful to not talk about it because it was too tricky. I, I was really hoping that someone would take the brand or, but I eventually we could continue. And then also the other part of was like, maybe it's better I don't continue. Mm -hmm. We were still at that time used to see designers staying like 20 years in exactly. house. So I was already like the fourth year and uh, one person who was working as a general director at Rochas at some point that left uh, called me back uh, and I was still at Rochas and he was now at Ritchie mm -hmm. and he was like, well, we would like to hire you. And so I was like, okay, if Rochas stops, I come. So I came. All right. So it was. We did, a, we did a resort for Rochas in July. Then we had like August month and September was at Ritchie. And wow. there were 14 employees from Rochas who were drift from Rochas to Ritchie. So it was incredible for me. I could keep my team and they could come accompany me there. Another perfume focused label. You know, what is that like for you to go, go so dramatically from one 
to another label, again, a house where there isn't a really clear definition history for what Rojas represents, the same thing that you had with Nina Ritchie. And, and how do you switch gears so quickly like that and, and come up with a new idea or a new aesthetic or were, were you just like, I'm me and I'm gonna, and now we're just gonna call it, you know, this? I think it's natural for me. Like I, I, I can do it. Um, I, I sometimes I compare this to the people who can be actors. Mm -hmm. They can go from one way of playing to another way and they still themselves, but somehow they can play different characters. And I, 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 am, I want to be very honest with my design. And especially when I work for another brand, I want to create designs that are relevant for that brand. Mm -hmm. So when you start with this mindset, you can approach any potential brand and imagine authentically what would be right for them, what would be exciting for them. Mm -hmm. And I also in the same way, I quickly know if something would inspire me or not. It depends on the richness of the heritage or, or if there is something that I think is like a strong element that I can creatively really develop on. Mm -hmm. And people marketing wise, they speak about the DNA. It's a bit of a horrible way, but essentially it's kind of true. Mm -hmm. Brands, they have a DNA, they have like a, an, a world that sort of like works with them. And you can enter that world and, and being yourself, you can really develop things for them that are different. What, so, okay, so then you're three years there and then, then, they, then that again implodes to a certain extent and they decide not to continue. It's like a coup contre coup, as they say in French, you know, um, a bit of a whiplash there. And then I know we talked about this before um, and just in polite conversation, but then you took off and traveled, right? And that was, that was I think, a real you know, eye-opening like, for over a year. What was that like for you? Well, for me, like, I was, honestly, I, I, I never really understood how it actually, I mean, when I was at Richie, it was a bit de de delicate because we changed general management uh, the last year I was there. And somehow I sometimes think like it happens a lot in brands. Like when the boss change, they decide to change what they think is relevant for change. And so they change a uh, designer myself. But I also wanted to explore the, pot the, the possibility to relaunch my brand. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and maybe it's because it was more, you know, the environment of that time. I was sort of like surprised by what my girlfriends were able to buy with a very good budget, kind of like clothes, 100% silk here and like with details there. And like, also they would go in a more mass, a more accessible mass market brand. They could find something nice. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, surprised because i had experienced before that if i would do just a simple shirt five buttons one pocket it would already cost 500 euros in store and whatever the price of the fabric at cheap polyester it would be so expensive and i wasn't understanding why so i wanted to understand that better and i was interested to do something more accessible and a, a person in the, the in the, the united states told me that i should maybe discuss with andrew rosen who was the boss of theory, just to speak about it, speak about what I wanted to do, that maybe he, he would have some advice for me. Mm -hmm. And when we met, we sort of like, sort of like worked. And he, and he later told me that eventually, maybe why not do something together first? Like, but I could bring a bit of my creative energy in his teams and start working together. And it sort of organically became like a more like a joint venture. So like an entrepreneur, project but a joint venture with the two brands and this that's was, how we start in theory so this was so you moving from this area then you, you know you move from nina ricci and rochas um you take a little time off and then you start exploring more of this global world of fashion in the sense with with theory so where there are stores in every corner of the world to learn more of more that aspect of the business was that what was interesting to you it was very interesting i also think that it was the let's say the golden age of the mid market mm -hmm. i think 2011 to 2015 was particularly special for mm -hmm. the mid market sector i don't think that today is the same Mm -hmm. But I think at the time, it was like the beginning for me where brands that were more accessible was kind of like were tempting to be more stylish or more fashionable. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were like doing a lot of copycats from what was happening in high fashion, mm -hmm. but some others were trying to be authentic while bringing novelty. Mm -hmm. And 
it was very interesting for me because it was also bring novelty in the way people dress in the li like being aware of their lifestyle and uh, you know it was uh, we were our offices were just about above our store and it was very interesting for me like I could really see how it works but the typologies and everything were also another part that interests me because it was a more generic cloth and I, I wanted to do also something more simple by the time yes because before it was quite elaborate and, and quite you know there's i mean you've, you've always right. been the, the best designers and, and tailors that I, I that i've ever seen so you know very you know intricate pieces to be able to kind of streamline that to something more mass that people more people can enjoy your work and then yeah. and then then that period ended and then you decided to come back and start your own brand again relaunch your signature label what was that just like a no-brainer like okay i've done theory i've done mass i've done you know these these couture houses you know fashion central in paris i want to go back to my roots what was the process there or did you just say i want to take a step back and break what made you decide to relaunch your brand well it was something that i always had wanted to do and i was always thinking that if i would be like for a long lapse of time on one spot i would end doing this at the same time than the other one and i never had like exclusive contracts i was always free to do it Mm -hmm. I never had done it because I felt oh, I need to be organized here before or I need, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I was also thinking like I should really focus on launching my own, uh, uh, my own brand. And maybe it's better I do it before I turn 40. Like I, I was thinking like I should like target a goal and have it done before I turn 40. Mm -hmm. So it was allowing me to have like one sabbatical year to think about it. And then, uh, like uh, in January 16, I start working on it. Mm -hmm. I went back to Italy, where I had been working for my own brand in the 90s and early 2000s. I went back to Italy. I visit again all the factories. Some of them I was working with them before, and like sort of like starting to talk about this project and seeing how I can organize it, how I would structure it, which was not an easy an easy task and uh and so i took a bit of a time for doing it and i did the first show for Tescans in september 16. i remember months after. like that was at the time of a pregnancy <laughs> to come with it <laughs> <laughs> what um what was it like for you then did it feel like you know you know riding the bike again was there no, was it just like going back uh to to your to your roots? Was, did it feel very different to start the company again? Was it, did it feel very organic? Yeah, no, no, not really. Back to my roots, not totally. I think you change. I, I don't like to, to be too much like passeist or something. The bizarre thing is that very quickly after I launched, I got approached by a museum, a fashion museum to do a retrospective. Yeah. Um, and so I was forced to look back to everything I did and I had to rearrange all my archives and I had all these boxes with my old clothes and I was like greasing them. Uh, even working on the exhibition, I had to put them back on the mannequins and it was like envisioning again the girl wearing it. It was very bizarre, but I, I was forced to look back. And obviously I have my own ways when it comes to my brand in terms of design and some of the things that I don't want to do, some of the things I'm going to look for. I, I always have a tendency to, to try to go forward and not repeat, but keep some of my classics re rearranged. It's, it definitely is my way, but I don't know. It was, it, it was like a natural process. I just am a creative person. And when it comes to my brand, I just think of what I want to see on the girls right now for, with my label on it. Well, then let's talk a little bit about that because you're continuing your label and now you're also moving into the world of couture to a certain extent with Azaro, what made you decide, okay, I'm going to do two brands and oh, by the way, one of them is going to be couture and mixed with ready to wear. But what made you go like, yeah, okay, I can, I'm going to do this. I can do this. Well, I needed some, some time for, with my brand before like spreading mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it's three years now that I, I, I have launched and I have been very, very busy uh, throughout these three years because mostly I've been busy to organize and bring the right scale to it. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's, a, it, it's done in a total autonomy, totally independently, and I'm really targeting like the best partners in the field for manufacturing, uh, all the service I can do. And it's, we're a very small company, but somehow after this, these three years, I think we found a form of organization that 
is suitable to allow me to spend more time also on the site and do another creative job. And the particularity with Vazaro is that although it's a very inspiring brand because it her its heritage is very specific and very rich to the 70s mostly and a bit of the 80s, it's very interesting uh, heritage. It also has a particularity to show its collection in during the Couture Week. Mm -hmm. It's a house that is invited to show its collection of ready-to-wear and couture uh, during the, the Haute Couture Week. So it's a very interesting thing for me because it's not the same time as the, the moment I do my own presentations. And it's a men and women, which is also something I wanted to be involved on menswear again. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's another facet that I haven't been able to explore because the world of Azaro has something more sensual, sultry. It's, it's another era, but I have never really been able to sort of like get in. Mm -hmm. But in the same time, I'm born in the 70s. It's something that is like, I can find roots of that. I can, I can link it to the way I saw the women dressed uh, on TV or people I was seeing around me in my family. I can, I can totally relate to that era. Well, yeah, I mean, it, that's true. That's interesting that you mentioned that because there, there are a lot of descriptives for your designs, but that central sexy thing, that's, that's not really what the, is the Olivier Siskin's aesthetic, really. So, it'd be, so is this like working a new muscle? I know you said you like to look at the history of a brand and see how you could, you know, put on that, you know, new role, as you say, like an actor. So that was what inspired you, that besides the timing, but also this idea of, of trying a new muscle, creative muscle that you haven't ever touch before well i i in the same time I'm, i think that the girls wearing my things at this can feel sexy yes because yes. I, they say that a lot they say I, they feel really really sexy but they don't feel vulgar mm -hmm. they don't That's feel true. vulgar and they don't feel tacky let's say so i think i like to to have uh, the girls sexy it's more like a connection with sort of like i for my own brand i also have this more there's a more arty element to something different it's a uh, it's less about the pleasure it's different it's a uh, and that's something that i'm going to work and articulate it's going to be uh, for me it is as long as i cannot like start the story and showing the collections people cannot really get it through words well, that's true that's true um, what are you going to what are you going to do in relationship to the the collection because considering that there won't be any shows in you know no couture no menswear are you still planning on presenting something in some way going forward in june or are we putting a pin in things for now well i think that uh, what's important is to have the capacity to adapt quickly um because who knows what's the state of mind we're going to have in two months what is for sure is i think it's good to not be inactive so I like to keep myself busy. There, there is like uh, enough measures in France to allow companies to have people on, we say, chômage partiel, which is like they get like on a more resting position, mm -hmm. but they still can be involved. And uh, so, and I myself like to keep designing, or drawing, sketching. The thing also is that, I mean, we are in Paris. So the minute people get back to work, they go fast. These guys, they go fast. <laughs> so we see. What it's is it like, like you? Me, it's, it's still a question mark. I think it's yeah. a question mark. What I think is that we are all going to be open mind to, you know, how people are going to do things, the scale of what they do, mm -hmm. the um, tempo of, of, like, we're going to be very open mind and very permissive. Mm -hmm. um, but still, people that are passionate are going to work at doing things the best they can. Always, always, always. What has it been like for you? I know your pieces when you're earlier, you know, your stuff is very couture in nature anyways, as it is, but has working for a couture house or doing couture pieces, does it feel anything different at all? Are you learning anything with, with, uh, with what you're doing with the Zara or, or are you bringing more to the table? What, you say? what I think I'm learning is that I can unfold something else from me. That's definitely, that's always a good learning. That's why, that's, that's probably the actor thing that is like excites people who are working in the city in, as actors. It's like doing a new role. They get like discovering things about themselves probably. But for me, um, what was the question again? <laughs> No, I mean, because I was the question was you talk about couture, you know, your pieces are. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, the, I think 
it's uh, it's going to be interesting to work uh, closely with the atelier. Uh, there is an atelier uh, in the house, which is very exciting. Obviously, the people there have more experience, life experience, so they are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, so we take care of them a lot. So I don't know when I'm going to actually be able to sit next to them and work with them. When it comes to working with the the embroiderers and all of these you know, like people connected with couture. I've, I've, I have the experience. I've been working on special pieces and I've been able to enjoy working with them. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of know a little bit of people, how they work in that field. Mm -hmm. I never thought that I could, because I'm too ready to wear, I would not be able to touch couture. I always think that it's, it's just, it's, it's very simple to touch couture. You just do a couture piece, uh, whatever it's like. When you want, you do it. So <laughs> I've never felt like I'm going to have to wait until I'm like getting like an old couture job to learn about it. Like I've always been focused on that. Mm -hmm. But it's exciting to know that actually we have a reason to do couture pieces. But the thing to know also is that I think it's interesting, and especially with me involved, is that the collection we show is ready to wear with a bit of couture, mm -hmm. which is something that I always naturally did for myself too. I always did like from simple pieces to extravagant pieces. I've always felt there is not really a borderline. There is like a, a small, like a, something fluid. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree that, that, I mean, it actually seems very much in organic and keeping with with the style that you've pulled through your entire career, this mixing of, mm. of very unique pieces and pieces that are much, much more wearable. I, I think that your career is yeah. important to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, Olivia, I, it's time for the five generic fashion questions. What okay. is your favorite piece of clothing that you own? That I own? Yeah, yours. No, I like some of the Helmut Long pieces I bought when I was like still at school. Ah. Because that was the thing, like these guys, like Andy Melmester, Helmut Long, Dirby Canvas, they were doing clothes that were expensive, but affordable for students. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't a pure luxury. It was like something you could get some of these if you were like brave enough to work on the side of school. Which piece for, for women or men, you know, uh, not everybody can afford something, you know, from a designer brand or something like that. But if there was one garment that you think that a woman or a man should really invest in, what would you say that is? Cashmere. <laughs> Anything cashmere. I could, I sincerely, I don't, I mean, invest now. Cashmere can be like so cheap, but actually it's still invest, an investment. It's still a quality, qualitative fiber it's just that for me it's the nicest to have on yourself and a nice cashmere always the best. Like nothing worse but a, a sort of like even like a luxurious sweater in like wool and polyester like you sweat in it it's a horrible thing i absolutely agree cashmere 100 percent all the way nothing else who is your favorite designer living or dead um it's a hybrid between vionne Balenciaga, all of these all of these founders mm -hmm. to get worth. Oh yeah, absolutely. To get I don't know, Saint Laurent, Chanel. I cannot like, I all love them so much because that there is some clarity between them. Uh, obviously in the fifties, some of them start being like, you know, the Jacques Fat. There were many very talented, but they were like collapsing together mm -hmm. at making a similar style. But uh, the founders for me are the key ones, you know, that okay. I love. What about, all right, my, next, my second to last question is, what trend will you never follow? I think it's, uh, the difficulty with me is that even when I try to follow a trend, I don't, I get, I get out of it. Okay. So it's very, very tricky, but um, it, it's bizarre because for, it's three years now, but I'm like focused on natural fibers. I'm not doing synthetic stuff. Like, and three years ago, it was like, it looked like a decision that was counter business. And I think that today it's definitely better to focus on the beautiful fibers and stop with this dirty, <laughs> polluting thing. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's Absolutely. strange. And so these trends of nylon thing, and I mean, the sport is great. Sport clothes are amazing. It's modernity. There is a lot of research and all of that, but luxury that starts selling in a high cost, like a deep, dirty nylon. No. I just think it's a ridiculous thing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
but, like but also I like that real I mean obviously there must be uh, amazing nylon things that come the garçon uh, but it's just that as a trend mm -hmm. that's why I, I start being like I start being very nervous when everybody start making fake fur because fake fur is a highly polluting item it's terribly polu terribly polluting and uh, I, I couldn't hear that thing about the fake fur I'm sorry no, I agree with you I agree with you and I think that the world of fashion, at least I hope, will move more in the direction of, you know, sustainability and, and you know, quality fibers, things that last longer than one season. I, I hope that that's the way we move forward. One last question. What do you love most about fashion? I mean, the beauty, the, 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 research, the, the research for beauty and like, it's uh, for, for people who don't know a thing about fashion, they, they don't understand. They just think it's like nuts and crazy. But it's the same for people who don't really take care of, ni of nice food, mm -hmm. of eating nicely. Like, it's the experience. Fashion is something to experience, of course. And but at the same time, it's also to be able. To, it's also good to 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 be able to live without it. Like I'm very happy without it too. But what I like is to project an idea of a research about beauty, a research of aesthetic. There is a lot of very nice virtues and qualities. Uh, and for me, the thing is that it's one of the things I I don't have to really much question because it's like. It was a natural thing I had. I, I directly have been obsessed with it. And because of what? Because I thought women were beautiful. So that's why I got very like, I think that the, the contemplation, the admiration, the obsession of, of that is one of the biggest pleasure I have since a child. Then that's very why it's natural to me. That's what I like. That's amazing that you're able to to have this dream of childhood become such a reality and that you're living your dream life to a certain extent. That's wonderful. Yeah, but you can, it's, it's so natural that you don't think about it anymore. Like I, I the pleasure is, a, is, is disguised. It's mm -hmm. very buried deep within because uh, people who see me every day, they cannot really read how happy I am about doing that. I'm just focused and I'm serious about doing it. But I, if I really stop and I know that it's because it's about, it's an expression of beauty that I'm like seriously trying to figure. And, um, and it's not like, I'm not on, the, on my, in my behavior, I'm not like, oh, I'm happy. Like, it's like, no, I'm like serious. <laughs> happy on the inside, Olivier, happy on the inside. Okay. Thank you so, so much. This was such a pleasure. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My pleasure, Jessica. Big kiss. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.